Plutarch's Lies, translated by John Dryden, revised by Arthur Hugh Clough, continues with Sulla, Sulla, Lucius, Cornelius, Sulla, was descended of a patrician, or noble family, of his ancestors, Rufinus, it is said, had been consul, and incurred a disgrace, more signal than his distinction, for being found possessed of more than ten pounds of silver plate, contrary to the law, he was, for this reason, put out of the Senate. His posterity continued ever after in obscurity, nor had Sulla himself any opulent parentage. In his younger days he lived in hired lodgings at a low rate, which in after times was adduced against him as proof that he had been fortunate above his quality, when he was boasting and magnifying himself for his exploits in Libaa, a person of noble station, made answer, And how can you be an honest man who scents the death of a father, who left you nothing, have become so rich? The time in which he lived was no longer an age of pure and upright manners, but had already declined and yielded to the appetite for riches and luxury, yet still in the general opinion they who deserted the hereditary poverty of their family were as much blamed as those who had run out a fair patrimonial estate, and afterwards, when he had seized the power into his hands and was putting many to death, a freedman suspected of having concealed one of the proscribed, and that for the reason sentenced to be thrown down the Tarpeian rock in a reproachful way, recounted how they had lived long together under the same roof himself for the upper rooms, paying two thousand sesterces and Sella for the lower three thousand, so that the difference between their fortunes then was no more the one thousand sister cast, equivalent in Attic coin to two hundred and fifty drachmas, and thus much of his early fortune. His general personal appearance may be known by his statues. Only his blue eyes of themselves extremely clean, uh, uh, ex extremely keen and glaring were rendered all the more forbidding and terrible by the complexion of his face, in which White was mixed with rough blotches of fiery red, hence it is said was surnamed Sulla, and an allusion to it one of the scurrilous jesters at Athens made the verse upon him. Sulla is a mulberry sprinkled o'er with meal, and I don't... Equality may mean that okay, a certain level of poverty or something or whatever by the employees, or, uh, that's that's one thing. Um, but limiting wealth um, by anything other than, well, certain charity, uh, charity um, obligations of some sort, um, you know, I, I don't see any grounds of that being, well, I, I mean, I know people, the reasons, but, you know, it doesn't seem to be right. Nor is it out of place to make use of marks of character like these, in the case of one who was by nature so addicted to raillery, that in his youthful, obscure years he would converse freely with players, and profess gestures, and join them in all their low pleasures, and when supreme master of all he was often wont to muster together with the impudent players and stage followers of the town, and to drink and bandy jests with them without regard to his age or the dignity of his place, and the prejudice of important affairs that required his attention. When he was once at table, it was not in Sulla's nature to admit of anything that was serious, and, whereas at other times he was a man of business, and austere of countenance, he underwent all of a sudden, at his first entrance upon wine and good fellowship, a total revolution, and was gentle and tractable, with common singers and dancers, and ready to oblige 
Any one that spoke with him, it seems to have been a sort of diseased result of this laxity that he was so prone to amorous pleasures and yielded without resistance to any temptation of voluptuousness from which even in his old age he could not refrain. He had a long attachment for Metropius, a player. In his first amorous, it happened that he made court to a common but rich lady, Nicopolis by name, and what by the air of his youth, and what by long intimacy, won so far on her affections that she rather than he was the lover, and at her death she bequeathed him her whole property. He likewise inherited the estate of a stepmother who loved him as her own son. By these means, he had pretty well advanced his fortunes. What does that mean? She was on top or, or, or you know, um, or just the um, level of control, control over the relationship or whatever. Um, he was chosen quaster to Marius in his first consulship and set sail with him for Libya to war upon Jugurtha. Here, in general, he gained approbation, and more especially by closing in dexterity with an accidental occasion, made a friend of Bacchus, king of Numidia. He hospitably entertained the king's ambassadors on their escape from some Numidian robbers, and after showing them much kindness, sent them on their journey with presents and an escort to protect them. Bacchus had long hated and dreaded his son-in-law, Jugurtha, who had now been worsted in the field, and had fled to him for shelter, and it so happened he was at this time entertaining a design to betray him, he accordingly invited Sulla to come to him, wishing the seizure and surrender of Jugurtha to be effected, rather through him than directly by him. So, Sulla, when he had communicated the business to Marius, and received from him a small detachment, voluntarily put himself into this immediate danger, and confiding in a barbarian who had been unfaithful to his own relations, to apprehend another man's person, made surrender of his own. Bacchus, having both of them now in his power, was necessitated to betray one or other, and after long debate with himself, at last resolved on his first design and gave up Jugurtha into the hands of Sulla. For this Marius triumphed, but the glory of the enterprise, which through people's envy of Marius, was ascribed to Sulla, secretly grieved him, and the truth is, Sulla himself was by nature vainglorious, and this being the first time that, from a low and private condition, he had risen to esteem among the citizens and tasted of honor, his appetite for distinction carried him to such a pitch of ostentation that he had representation of this action engraved on a signet ring which he carried about with him and made use of ever after. The impress was Bacchus delivering and Sulla receiving Jugurtha. This touched Marius to the quick. However, judging Sulla to be beneath his rivalry, he made use of him as lieutenant in his second consulship and in his third as tribune, and many considerable services were effected by his means. When acting as lieutenant, he took Capilus, chief of the Tectosages prisoner, and compelled the Marcians, a great and populous nation, to become friends and confederates of the Romans. Henceforward, however, Sulla, perceiving that Marius bore a jealous eye over him and would no longer afford him opportunities of action, but rather opposed his advance, attached himself to Catullus, Marius's colleague, a worthy man, but not energetic enough as a general, and under this commander, who entrusted him with the highest and most important commissions, he rose at once to reputation and to power. He subdued by arms most part of the Alpine barbarians, and when there was a scarcity in the armies, a scarcity in the armies, he took that care upon himself, and
and brought in such a store of provisions as not only to furnish the soldiers of Catullus with abundance, but likewise to supply Marius. This, as he writes himself, wounded Marius to the very heart, so slight and childish were the first occasions and motives of that enmity between them, which passing afterwards through a long course of civil bloodshed and incurable divisions, defined its end in tyranny, and the confusion of the whole state proved Euripides to have been truly wise and thoroughly acquainted with the causes of disorders in the bloody politic, when he forewarned all men to beware of ambition, as of all the higher powers, the most destructive and pernicious to our votaries. Now, see the capital letters, because um, people did treat things as, well, I mean, divine qualities, but then people personified them and all that other stuff. This, this is why we have the, you know, reason to think that the whole uh, polytheism thing came later, is that Oh, uh, transcendent, and then you get individual uh, qualities or manifestations, and then people eventually personify and end up thinking that things are um, other gods and all that. 